Thank you, Mark. Um, I'm going to do some presentations now that are different in terms of the topics that are covered, but also similar in that they showcase some member-led projects that EPIC have been involved in. So these member organisations have approached us with an intervention or innovation that needed evaluating in a rapid, time-limited period. And we've been able to respond to this partly by utilising the consultancy model available to us at Lancaster University that, is, that has facilitated this responsive approach to working with partner organisations. So in addition to supporting partner organisation led projects, one aim for this work will be that ultimately these smaller local evaluations could lead to bigger externally fund, uh, funded projects. So now possibly, not in order of appearance, you're now going to hear more from Jenny West, who's the Associate Director of Digital Change at the Health Innovation Agency, and Francis Riley, the Public Health Development, Man Development Manager at Blackburn with Darwin Borough Council. So I'm Jenny West, I'm the Associate Director for Digital Change at the Innovation Agency, which is the AHSM for the North West Coast. Tell us, we're going to talk about benefits realisation, but what is that first of all? So benefits realisation is for any digital system that you want to implement, so we're, we're looking at it from a digital point of view, you should expect a return on investment, be that qualitative return on investment, so you're improving the quality of care for a patient, staff, carers, or it could be an actual financial return on investment, so, uh, and that's part of what we're trying to work out as part of this feasibility study in collaboration with the ARC. What is the focus of this particular feasibility study? So it's, we're focusing it around remote monitoring. Um, part of my role is working with the region, so NHS England's regional team, digital team, on regional scaling, which is essentially remote monitoring and trying to ramp up off the back of COVID. I mean, well, actually, in fact, they started before COVID, but with the advent of COVID, the expansion of virtual wards and the, the government wanting to introduce more um, remote monitoring for long-term conditions. We want to start to focus on that particular area because it's part of that bigger project and we want to see can we really dig deeper and find out where does the real return on investment come for remote monitoring. What do you actually look at then in order to make that assessment and have those judgments? What is it you're actually studying? So there's two parts to it. There's going to be a quantitative element. So that's going to be the hard cash financial elements that we can get our hold of. Always the most difficult and they always take time to appear. So part of our problem statement around this has been what Robert Walker said in his report when he did Making IT Happen after the National Programme. Generally, the return on investment for any digital implementation is years down the line. You can see some qualitative uh, return on investment early doors, but to really see the benefits, and particularly where we're monitoring long-term conditions, we want to know that that intervention has stopped somebody getting worse and that we've made that difference. And to do that, you need longevity to those benefits, which we just currently don't have. So this feasibility study is about can we create a dashboard that will constantly monitor what we believe the benefits of this to be um, and, to, and therefore creating longevity. You take it away from the project and you put it into business as usual at an ICS regional level. Um, the other side of it with the qualitative work, um, this is the part where the ARC are really helping us with, is starting to define what are the topics we need to look into, what do we need to dig deeper on in terms of qualitative benefits, what are, what are the right questions we should be asking the patients, carers, staff, that will allow us to really build on what, it, what that remote monitoring has done for them and their work life. Tell us more about the role of the ARC, what value are they bringing to this work? Well, the ARC, I mean, it was quite a serendipitous conversation. So originally I started this conversation with Rosie Corr, who's a deputy medical director at MerseyCare, who leads the remote monitoring in Cheshire and Mersey. And we were talking at the Connect conference about what benefits realisation meant to us and could we do more for remote monitoring? Because the evidence base is fairly weak. And when you're trying to get financial directors to get involved with this, th there's not so much the evidence there to kind of prove it. So we had, I had the conversation with Rosie and then as it happened, some money came available at regional level with NHS England and Janet King. And I put a bid in, could we do a feasibility study around benefits of remote monitoring to really dig into it, follow the rabbits, where does the benefit really appear? And with that conversation, I met up with Paula uh, Wheeler from the ARC and Paula has been a driving force in getting this moving with me. So between myself, Rosie and Paula, this has been a juggernaut that we only had a short time frame. We've got to deliver something by March. So Paula brought on board Joanna Goldthorpe and Bethany Gill as our researcher. 
and they are working to incredibly tight timescales, but we've just kept moving and they've been so supportive, always at every meeting and really helping drive this forward. And with the support of Rosie's clinical leadership and Joe McGuigan over in Lancashire in South Cumbria, who's the SRO for region of remote monitoring over there, we've been able to get a bit ahead of steam around this. And now we've got people coming at us from lots of directions. The 5G project in Liverpool are interested in what we're doing. The frailty lead is quite interested in what we're doing in Cheshire and Mersey, as is the cardiac consultant um, leading the cardiac virtual ward wants to have a chat with us about how we're doing this so that they can start to build on that work. So we're going to work with the Cypher team in Cheshire and Mersey with the data outlets that we can get over in Lancashire and South Cumbria and we're going to see how far we can go with it. Can you say what the evidence is showing you so far about remote monitoring? What benefits you've been able to see? It's been from the quantitative side it's been shown it's going to be quite difficult actually because a lot of the time the three main key benefits that are quoted are reduction in length of stay reduction in bed days reduction in a and e visits actually getting into what that means they're an outcome and yes there's a cost associated with that bed but that bed will always be filled so what are we really looking at what's the benefit is it that the patient's been released early and therefore it's a qualitative benefit to them is it that we're enabling capacity to reduce the waiting lists in which case at what point do we see that really start to happen and that impact happen further down the line it's you once you start to dig a little bit you suddenly open a lot of kind of worms and then there's also the fact can we actually get that data to prove it so if we were anticipating that we're thinking well, we might widen the funnel for waiting lists What's the data we need to prove that and that it's our project that had an impact on that? So some of them, we've got lists of benefits from all the research that we've done. So Bethany uh, did a great uh, literature, literature review for us around all the qualitative and quantitative work. We got a great systematic review from York University around the quantitative elements. We dissected all of those outline what we think are outcomes and what we want to break that down into into benefits and now we're starting to follow the rabbits where do we go how far do we go with this we've got our data analyst here at the innovation agency Casey who's really getting to grips with all the data and what we can get hold of um, and generating a lot of interest so I'm really pleased and honestly we couldn't have done it without Paula and Rosie behind us really driving this we wouldn't have got as far as we've got with it and I'm quite excited to see how far we can go with it as our next steps. How far could you go with your next steps? Well, ideally, we've talked about how we'd like to start to build this kind of almost um, observatory of benefits around digital implementations that's a central place. Now, it can sit at ICS level, can sit at regional level. But what it means is across the Northwest Coast, if we've got an ability to kind of build into this dashboard and the benefits just keep building up and the data just keeps building up behind it, then we'll start to see the longevity. We'll start to see when projects break even. We'll start to see is somebody on a hypertension pathway is the fact that we intervened early with their high blood pressure. Have we stopped them ever getting worse? But we need years of data to prove that. And that's the ultimate goal is can we build something that allows us to do that and measure this for years to come? Hello everyone, uh, my name is Frances Riley. I'm a Public Health Development Manager for Blackburn with Darwin Council in East Lancashire. Blackburn with Darwin Council are members of the ARC, um, which gives us access to evaluation and implementation expertise and advice from academics and research staff from the local universities. I have been asked today to speak to you about the relationship that we as a public health team have with the ARC and in particular the EPIC team and a project that we are working on together. So why are we a member of the ARC and how is it of use to us? I want to use an example um, to explain this. Um, so back in May last year, PHE or OHID as it is now known, announced funding for the 40 most deprived local authorities as part of the Mental Health Action Recovery Plan. This came to be known as the Better Mental Health Grant. This funding was to be spent within the financial year and was to be used on developing and delivering prevention and promotion projects that would support better mental health in our areas. We were given two weeks to submit our expression of interests for this money. 
So amidst that two weeks when we were at the coalface of the development of our bid, we felt able to pick up the phone and call our contact at ARC and ask for any resources we could utilise to evaluate our three projects. At this point, the details around the projects were very high level. Um, they were evolving with every conversations we had with partners. Um, so some of the conversation we had with ARC, with ARC at this point was theoretical, but it was just useful to be able to have this informal advice, this point of view from experts, which gave us knowledge and confidence in our approach. At this point, we didn't know about any additional money for evaluation, and so we were having to think about building our evaluation into our project costings and ask our project delivery partners to work with us on evaluating the project. The ARC gave us timely, useful advice, and we were able to submit our expression of interest. Once we had got confirm confirmation that we had got the funding, um, we worked really closely with our delivery partners to firm up the details of our three projects. Our projects were a whole school suicide prevention approach. So here we, uh, our delivery partners were Papyrus, the National Charities for Young People's Suicide. And we'd asked them to work with our 16 secondary schools in Blackburn with Darwin to provide the whole school community, so young people, staff and parents, with advice and support and support information so they knew what to do if they were worried about someone in their lives. This was delivered or was this was to be delivered through assemblies, classroom sessions and training sessions. And it also involved the development of a suicide prevention policy for the school if they wanted one. Our second project was the recruitment and training of young people as wellbeing champions in community settings. So this was about training young people to deliver peer-based wellbeing advice and signposting information in community settings such as youth groups, brownies, cubs, guides, um, anything they were doing outside of school. And our delivery partner for this project was Realign Futures Community Interest Company. This project was also about the collaboration with the young people about designing what a wellbeing champion, what the role of a wellbeing champion was. Our third project was the Healthy Mind Safe Home project, in which we brought together two partners, Lancashire Mind and Shelter, to provide a support package to people aged 16 to 34 that would meet their housing, debt, benefits and well-being needs all in one place. So these were our three projects. In October, it became clear that some additional funding was available to us from OHID to complete an evaluation of the three projects. So at this point, we went back to ARC and reminded them of our conversation we'd had back in May. This time, the discussions were more in depth and they helped us think about what we wanted from our evaluation. And it was also very practical. We had to spend this money in a short period of time and how could we do this? One of the challenges of having funding to spend on an evaluation to be delivered and completed in six months is recruiting someone to deliver the evaluation. We had no capacity within our team to deliver the evaluation and as a local authority we have little flexibility to temporarily employ someone for such a short period. This is where our membership membership of ARC really helped us. We have been able to recruit someone via the Employment Recruitment Service of Lancaster University. Uh, we've been able to employ a research associate who firstly knows and understands the job role, but also someone who understands the nature of short-term contracts and is used to undertaking them. We are very pleased to have someone in place. We are now in a position where we have a research associate undertaking our evaluation, who is embedding themselves in our projects and within the public health team. We have a supportive relationship with EPIC to help oversee the evaluation and provide support where required. We have the added value of our shared comms in forums such as this and the OHID National Better Mental Health Grant meeting. And we have regular meetings with EPIC building the relationship further and thinking about future development and collaborations and the possibility of looking for external grant funding. 
So in summary, uh, working with the ARC has been really beneficial to us. Um, we have been able to utilise um, support and advice at moments, at points in time across the last nine months when we've needed it the most. Um, to be uh, the team themselves that we've been working with have worked to our timescales and really um, mobilised themselves so that they can um, to be able to support our deadlines that we've had to work to. They provided us with a really flexible way of working and we've been able to utilise their kind of methods of employment and um, which have just really helped helped us to um, to mobilise our project and, and in particular mobilise the evaluation so quickly. Um, when I compare ourselves to other areas who aren't uh, members of the ARC who are having to undertake this evaluation um, by themselves or internally, they're really struggling. They don't have the expertise in house. Um, they don't have the capacity to do it. And um, with such a short time frame to deliver the evaluation, they are really struggling. Um, so it's been incredibly beneficial. Um, it's something I think we'd absolutely want to repeat. Um, and hopefully Epic feel the same way about working with us at Blackburn with Darwin. And I just want to thank um, Paula and Joanna for, for allowing me to share that with you today. Thanks very much. Oh, hi, um, I'm Jenny Pope from Lancaster University. I'm a sociologist working in public health and I'm, um, as, as Mark said earlier, I'm going to, um, I'm going to show you this web resource that we've developed out of the learning from the Neighbourhood Resilience Programme. Uh, the Neighbourhood Resilience Programme was implemented between 2016-2019 in the Clark Northwest Coast. Um, so just a few words about the programme before I get into the website and fingers crossed that um, I won't have any mishaps when navigating, de demonstrating it to you. Um, so the, the programme um, was a response really to um, the interest in the health field and in public health in particular in, in the community as a setting in which to act on the social determinants of health that might be amenable to local action. So that might be air pollution, the quality of housing, uh, debt problems, financial insecurity, those, those kind of the structural determinants of health inequalities. But um, in, so from about the beginning of the global financial crisis, which has probably sunken into all our memories with the pandemic, and then exacerbated by the pandemic with growing inequalities, um, the focus started to shift on this idea of community resilience and communi the initiatives that would build the resilience of communities bearing the brunt of inequalities to kind of come up with creative ways of responding and improving the social determinants of health. And there are basically two problems with that approach. Uh, the approach of community resilience. The first is that actually it, it risks further stigmatising those communities that are bearing the brunt of, of social inequalities that drive health inequalities by labelling them as in need of having their resilience built. When in fact we know that there are enormous strengths in these communities and their capacity to cope with the difficult circumstances they're living in is often really really um, a source of inspiration. So that's the first problem. The second problem with the notion of community resilience and using that as a framework for action um, is that uh, it focuses on the community and it's kind of saying to the community, uh, this is your job to do this and we will support you. And as soon as you start showing the capacity to respond to social determinants in your neighborhood, then we'll, 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 we'll back away. We'll support you, but we'll back away. Um, and the problem with that is that despite the fact that communities bearing the brunt of social inequalities are enormously resilient, their capacity to act on their own or even with light support from the services is limited by their lack of resources, um, the difficulties they're facing in their lives. So the Neighbourhood Resilience uh, Programme was, was interested in resilience, but it took a systems perspective. So the, the underpinning concept in the Neighbourhood Resilience Programme was that a resilience is a property of the system in neighbourhoods, not just a property of the residents, of the people who live there. So the capacity to 
uh, act creatively, to think of ways to improve the social determinants of health that are amenable to local action, resides in the people who live and work in neighbourhoods and the institutions that operate in those neighbourhoods. So it's a collective capacity and everybody has to engage in that equally, residents, workers, professionals, managers, etc. So that's where the neighbourhood resilience um, programme was coming from. Um, and the other thing I would say just before showing you the website is that some people have said this is just um, a pedantic point. You're just changing the language. We're not trying to change the language. The programme was trying to change the mindset and that to shift people from thinking about resident communities as the focus for action to the system being the focus for action. And that could have profound implications for the effectiveness of some of the neighbourhood work that is being done in the health sector. So let's see if I can uh, show you some of this website. There's a lot of information on there. Um, so uh, it'll, be a, it'll be a quick and incomplete tour, um, but uh, let's have a go. So hopefully you can now see the landing page. I can't see any of you, so I don't know whether whether it's there, but I'll, uh, oh, Mark's putting a thumb up. That's great. So this is, here's the landing page and a uh, bit of, uh, just to make that point about DIY welfare and DIY resilience, this poster here is making the point that um, some of these communities want to be, they want you to stop, want us to stop calling them resilient because in the sense of doing things themselves to address the social determinants of health, they are indeed not resilient on their own. They need the system to be operating with them. So the website, the web resource has got four components to it. Uh, there's the Neighbourhood Resilience Programme, which is explained, and there's a, a learning tool, and I'll come back to you that. There's um, a section of the website which is devoted to the Community Research and Engagement Network, which was set up in the Clark and um, was a very key component of the Neighbourhood Resilience Programme. And of course, it's continued into the arc and is changing and developing. So there's a Corrin under the programme and there's the Corrin now and there's new material going on about what's happening in the Corrin now. In the programme, the Community Research and Engagement Network was essentially a network of uh, community voluntary faith sector organisations working very closely with the nine neighbourhoods in which the programme was implemented and they recruited and supported residents to be involved as equals in this, in this programme. So it's a key way of changing the power dynamics so that uh, residents became part of the system that was operating, not the target of the intervention. And then there are case studies which describe the work in each of the nine neighbourhoods, but there are also case studies about very specifically about the actions that the neighbourhoods took and also about the evaluation that we did of the programme. And finally, there's some general resources. So let's have a look at the programme, the tool. Um, there's actually a short animation, which I'm gonna try and play. And I'm looking for Mark's thumb again to tell me that it's able to be heard when it's going. This tool shares learning from the Neighbourhood Resilience Programme to support more effective local action for greater health equity. Open questions encourage reflection on how the learning can be used. There's no formal start, but it's best to work through the four parts in order. Neighbourhood resilience framework, a framework for local action. Underpinning principles for working together. Program infrastructure, the building blocks, and neighbourhood implementation. Local elements developed iteratively and can be explored in any order, but you could read the overviews in each section first. They all kicked off with getting started events when people identified local priorities for action. There are links to neighbourhood case studies and materials on outputs, impact, residents' experience, and other resources. We hope you enjoy the tool. 
Okay, so um, that that's intended to try and help people navigate through it. As I say, there is a lot of information in the tool. It's really important to say this isn't how to do neighborhood resilience. It the, 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 This has been designed as a space for people who are working in local areas on health issues to think about how some of the learning from this program might help them really. So, so it, 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 what, what happens, I'll take you into the tool just very briefly. It's got these four elements that were uh, uh, highlighted in the animation and uh, the, each of them has got a set of reflexive questions associated with it so that you're encouraged to think, okay, so what might this mean for me in my work? But it's, there's also a set of issues about what went well, what we think well, well, what we think didn't go so well. And let me see if I can find, I'll go into the neighborhood implementation. So these are the different phases of the implementation in each of the nine neighborhoods. As the animation over a voiceover said, there was no, um, this was not a linear process. Each of the neighborhoods started with a getting started event where people were thinking about what the priorities were that they wanted to act on. And they also set up a local oversight group, which was a system focused group. So it had represent, it had residents on there, but also local authority people and representatives from other sectors that were relevant to the issue being addressed in the neighborhood. Um, so if you go, for example, let's look at mobilizing and sharing knowledge. Um, there, there's the, these were the different kinds of actions that were involved in generating knowledge. So there were the residents led inquiries into, for example, local air pollution issues, into housing problems, into loneliness. And on the back of this, you've got the overview, then the inquiries, and then the lessons learned. So if you can see the lessons learned, and this is the same with each of the sections, we're very honest about what we think went well, but what we think went less well. And then here are these reflective questions to get you to think about, okay, this is what happened in the neighborhood of resilience. What's the implications of all of that for us? So let's just have a quick look at the, at the case studies. As I said, there are uh, case studies for each of the nine neighborhoods and they just explain what happened. The people who were involved are named there. Enormous number of people to credit for all of this work. We can't possibly go through them, um, but they've contributed to the program and also to this web resource. Then there are case studies about the impacts that the program had. And these five areas were actually part of the, um, the framework that, um, that shaped the program. So we knew that in order to, from the literature, we knew that in order to support and nurture system resilience, we needed to improve social connectedness. We needed to increase cultural resilience. What we mean by that is the development of a shared sense of purpose amongst the actors in a system. That people not only shared issues and concerns, but a confidence that they could act together to improve things. We needed to try to improve issues in the local economy. We needed to try and improve the living environment. And absolutely key to systems resilience is developing governance spaces where the different system players can operate as equals. And we did evaluate both qualitatively and quantitatively. This was a modest program, you know, it was about over the three years almost four years, it was about £40,000 per area, which I know is not little money, but still it's pretty modest compared to some. And then in-kind contributions from lots of different people, including the residents. And what, what was really quite surprising, I thought, was that we had quite a significant impact on people's sense of being socially connected, residents with other residents, residents with professionals in the local authority in the third sector, workers within the different sectors who talked about improved relationships and what that connectedness did was improve information flows, improve skill sharing and improve, connect, sorry, improve collaborative action. So this relatively modest program led to quite significant social connection improvements and that was showed in our survey. So people were actually talking about being more connected. 
but it also led to much more inclusive um, governance. So the, the residents who were involved were quite clear that they felt that their voices were being heard, that they were involved equally as partners and that they were having an impact with other system players on their neighborhood. So you'll find about, you can find out about how we did the evaluation and what the, what the kind of key findings were on the website. So I'm going to stop sharing because um, obviously there's loads on here that you can get into. The, um, the web link, I think, should be posted in, in, the, um, in the chat. Uh, it's, it's relatively simple. It's uh, neighborhood resilience, all one word, dot UK. Um, but hopefully, yes, you've got that. You've got that in the chat now. Please go in and have a look. Um, where if you've got any questions, I, I will be, I've got a few minutes, I think I can try and answer. If anybody, they'll be forwarded to me so I can respond to that. We're now at the stage of um, disseminating this. Uh, so if anybody's got any ideas for who might be interested in us going to talk about it, um, that would be brilliant to hear. If you go on to it and you have ideas about how we can improve it, we'll do our best. Of course, though, resources are now quite limited. We've got, we've got people who would be willing to have a go at that. But the key thing is to try and see ways of bringing it into um, places where it can help, it can support people. This programme had a lot of learning about place-based action in neighbourhoods that are bearing the brunt of social inequalities and therefore health inequalities and if we can improve that working if we can make it more effective in addressing the structural determinants of of health inequalities then then we should take every opportunity to do that so um there's no questions so far so um I think thanks I jenny um are there any questions please put them in the chat but we are actually at our quarter past um there's a comment from peter Yes, I see that. Thanks. Great stuff. Okay. Creating governance spaces for local action really important. Sometimes need things in place to be disinvented. So it's uh, uh, yes, there are often barriers to people being involved rather than enablers. I think that's what Peter's referring yeah, to. Absolutely. And I do think the one of the key questions, one of the key issues about the, this program is that it's not the same. It's not the same as community resilience. It's not just a, a, a clever way of changing the language. And I would really actively encourage people to go onto the site and, and, and find out more about that important mindset difference. Thank you. Thank you.